Good evening. I'm David Price, and this is Pennsylvania Inside Out Issues. Our topic tonight is workforce education. And as I prepared for this program, it quickly became apparent that we would need somewhere in the area of several years to a lifetime to get it all on the table. So actually, tonight we're going to consider Pennsylvania's workforce, the uh, status quo, uh, where opportunities lie. Does everybody have to go to college? And we'll get some uh, areas uh, that mid-career professionals may be pondering, as well as some things for parents or grandparents and other adults of influence to consider when having career conversations with the young adults in their lives. Joining us tonight, Kenneth Gray, the professor in charge of Penn State's Workforce Education and Development Program in the College of Education, and to his left, uh, Craig Weideman, Penn State's Vice President of Outreach, a division that includes continuing education, agricultural extension, and Penn State public broadcasting. Gentlemen, thank you very much mm -hmm. for joining us. Uh, Ken, I'd like to, to start with you. Uh, and it, if you're holding the mantle and, and, and or carrying the flame in this workforce education discussion, uh, what, what is your theme, as it were? Uh, well, my major theme is that there are many ways to win. One, of course, is baccalaureate education, but the one that's most often looked is one- and two-year post-secondary technical education. In fact, strictly in terms of uh, supply versus demand, there's greater opportunity for technicians than there are for people with four-year degrees. And so I'm, my message is not, is not don't go to college. My message <laughs> is, you know, take a look at Penn College of Technology, um, take a look at techno, you know, technician-level work because there are many empty seats on the airplane and unfortunately, for a lot of four-year graduates, the plane is oversold. Uh, Craig, uh, you and I work for uh, Outreach here at mm -hmm. Penn State, and I uh, mentioned continuing education. Um, and, and there's this concept of lifelong learning. We talk about lifelong learning as it associates uh, with the academy uh, in general. Uh, so far as Penn State Outreach, what, what is the role of continuing education in the lives of Pennsylvania? Well, I think it plays a very important role, David. Um, we have uh, campuses all over the state and all of them are working with their region, with their local workforce investment board, with their uh, uh, faculty to build programs to respond to the particular workforce needs in the regions in the state. So it's a very important part of our role. And also, I mean, the undergraduates here are basically, as Ken pointed out, preparing for positions. And so they're really, a good bit of our work at Penn State is to prepare people for employment. So, I mean, and the, the issue though, David, you're talking about lifelong learning is absolutely critical at this time as far as the changes in society and the demands on workers. You mentioned uh, prepare people for employment and it seems to me that it wasn't very long ago when going to college was to get an education, mm -hmm. was to make you a more rounded and in, uh, in, uh, intellectual person, to give you critical thinking skills and, and all of these things. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily uh, workforce education. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, I think the best indication of what did happen is that when you poll young people in college and ask them why they're there, of the top four reasons, three are economic. Mm -hmm. Number one is to get a better job. Number two is to learn things I already know. But now people view college as the one way to win. You know, get a four-year degree, why earn a lot of money, we're in the professions. And is, so is this that is sort of the mantra mm -hmm. that's out there. Is that an accurate assessment? Uh, you uh, do look at the technical uh, training qu quite a bit, and, and uh, there is you know, th that uh, image of, if I go to college, I'm going to make more money. And uh, uh, we're going to ask you to sort of factor out if you don't graduate from high school, because I, I think that's pretty, pretty stiff. If you don't graduate from high school, that is a, a definitely known mm -hmm. negative. But uh, looking at uh, college education versus technical training, is that perception of uh, going to make more money accurate? Um, well, not necessarily so. Eighty-three percent of individuals with an associate degree have the same or higher annual earnings as people with a four-year degree. Um, so that the, you know, it's just simply a question of supply and demand. There's a new term that's being bandied around called gray employment, not gray <laughs> like me. Um, but these are individuals who have baccalaureate degrees um, who end up in, in, you know, jobs that simply don't require that level of education. Unfortunately, 
only 12 percent of all work requires just a four-year degree. So the idea that we tell everyone to prepare to compete for 12 percent of work obviously sets a lot of young people up to fail. What do we get from a four-year degree? Really, what, what, what's in there? What, what do we find, mm -hmm. do you think? Well, there's, a, I mean, there's things, as, as Ken pointed out, I mean, getting a job is on very much in the foremost of students' interests, and also their parents, in many cases, are paying for the tuition. But, I mean, I, I think it's beyond just the, um, uh, the training or the education for the job, but it's also, I think, hopefully, you're developing skills of problem solving, uh, communication, participating on teams, presentation. I think, but probably the most important thing, David, is, is that you're learning to learn. The ability to learn, which I think in the future is going to be probably the most important skill set because you look at the changes in the, in the employment opportunities, that if you don't know how to learn and adapt with new skills, you're going to be uh, in a difficult spot, whether it's a technical education or a bachelor's. Mm -hmm. I think learning to learn is probably the most important thing. You, you talked about workforce needs, and, and uh, the United States workforce has changed, and Pennsylvania's workforce has changed uh, right along with it, if not at a faster rate, just because we don't make stuff like we used to. I mean, we used to manufacture things, and uh, now it's almost, it feels almost like there are many more people who get paid to have opinions about making things <laughs> than actually making things. Uh, your thoughts on that assessment? Mm -hmm. Well, I hear this term, knowledge workers, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but I, I envision individuals that work in cubicles in front of computer desks. The only thing I would point out and ask the audience, I mean, what kind of work do you think is going to be the easiest to offshore in the future? What kind of work is going to face the most dramatic international competition? Exactly that kind of work. And so, in a lot of supposedly high skill areas in knowledge, we have now something called high skill low wage work simply because the, you know, the, the supply is not the U.S., the supply is the world. Well, it's easy. I mean, everybody's you know, connected via the Internet or a telephone line. Greg, I interrupted you. You're ready to say something there? Well, just a couple of things. One is that um, in, in looking at uh, the concern about outsourcing and that, just a couple of points. You, you talked about manufacturing. I visited two plants recently, one of which had 80 employees. It was a um, plastics manufacturer. They now have 19 and they're more profitable, but they're concerned about international competition. This week I was in a plant in Altoona that was a printing company that years ago had 176 people on the floor and about 25 people in the office. They now have 460 employees, of which they still have 176 on the floor. They have the same number of manufacturers. They've, I don't know, increased their revenues rap significantly, but they have a lot of people working. In this case, they're, they're working on information preparation for the printing. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing some changes, and they said, are we a manufacturing company or a, a service company? Mm -hmm. The other thing, to Ken's point as far as um, being untouchable, as far as uh, being, your job being outsourced, Thomas Friedman, who wrote the book, um, The World is Flat, has been talking around the country, and he's saying that you need, to do, you need to consider four things to be untouchable. One is to be very special. You know, Michael Jordan's not going to be outsourced or Bill Gates. The second is to have a specialized skill. You know, where, where you are, um, you know, uh, uh, intellectual property lawyer or a surgeon, or even in Baltimore, there's a, a gentleman who sells uh, lemonades at the Camden Yards, who when he makes his lemonade, he shakes, and all of a sudden his whole body starts shaking. <laughs> he sells more lemonade than anybody else. And then the third is to be anchored. You know, you need a barber nearby, you need a chef nearby. Uh, Frito-Lay's not going to move because they cannot afford to, to, trans to have their... their Fritos made in China and then shipped over here. And then finally, probably the most important thing again is the adaptability, is the ability to learn. If you want to be untouchable, it's constantly looking at developing your skills. You're talking about that company uh, that had, they used to have 80 employees, mm -hmm. now they have uh, 19, mm -hmm. and, and they are, uh, they're making more money th mm -hmm. than ever, and uh, by golly, I'm a capitalist, and mm -hmm. uh, good for them. But not so good for 61 other people. Mm -hmm. So in looking at workforce education, in thinking about there's a potential, a significant potential, for us to see other com companies across Pennsylvania <clears throat> who do uh, shrink their manufacturing size and go down to 19 uh, employees. So then there's a significant number of people who need jobs. What do we, what do we teach them? If, they're, if, they're, uh, if they've been manufacturers, if they've been in a factory setting for so many years, 20, 30 years, what do we teach them when they're in the middle of their career and it's, you know, the boom is coming down? I was going to look to you for that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a tough one. 
Yeah, for, you know, incumbent workers, displaced workers, is is absolutely the biggest challenge. And you know, the uh, what we see too much of is uh, you know solutions such as teaching um, Microsoft Word or some kind of uh, computer type skills. Whereas now, I think the thinking is that the emphasis should be transitioned to some type of employment, and then when you know while they're working, provide opportunities for them to change their skill set. Often the dilemma, candidly, and, the, and no one's sure what to do with that, is when you close a plant in a certain area, the, you know, you put a lot of people out of work, um, but the economy doesn't generate that many jobs right there. Right. And so the idea, again, is to first think about placement services, ability to move, how do you, you know, so forth and so on, mm -hmm. versus training and some kind of generalized skill set that there may not be employment in. And, and this is not a problem unique to Pennsylvania, but what you're seeing across the country where a plant that might be the major employer leaves that region and then the people are lost. And, and the thing is, there's a couple issues. One is in Pennsylvania, I mean, there's a real need for nurses. And I was visiting one of the local counties, and they said, well, we'll train these people in nursing. Well, a lot of these people don't want to be nurses. You know, that's one issue. The other issue is that when I talk to a lot of people across the state, they say, I want my manufacturing job back. Well, it's not going to come back. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some of them have not had a good experience in school back when they were in school, so they don't look to retraining. So it's a really tough, tough issue, David. Yeah. Let me uh, stop for here a moment and say uh, you are watching Pennsylvania Inside Out Issues on WPSU. I'm David Price, and uh, tonight our topic is workforce education. And our guests are Penn State's Vice President of Outreach, Craig Weideman, and from Penn State's College of Education, uh, Kenneth Gray, and thanks uh, very much to you for joining us. Uh, you mentioned that uh, my family's from West Virginia, uh, and they're coal miners mm -hmm. and sustenance farmers to, mm -hmm. to a great extent. And by golly, it was probably when I was born in the 60s, early, early 60s, that the coal mines went away. Mm -hmm. And they still keep talking about, well, when the coal mines come back, mm -hmm. say, well, they ain't coming back. Mm -hmm. Um, but we still live here. You know, Pennsylvania does face the, uh, uh, an aging population uh, and a youth drain. A lot of the young people, when, once they graduate from high school, they, they just want to go, I want a ticket that will take me anywhere but here. In parents talking to the kids getting ready to graduate from high school, and, and Ken, I'll direct this to you, are there some cases where they, they should just say, you know, my kid should not go to college, and I know why. And how do you recognize that, and how do you say that to a kid who may want to go to college? Um, well, it's not too difficult to uh, to <laughs> see when, you know, some people should not. They only have to look at, you know, high school attendance, high school grades. Some young people just plain don't like school. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think it's a question of going yes or no right out of high school. The question is, should I go now? Um, we're into this mindset, which I think is sort of harmful, that if a, you know a young uh, person comes out of high school and is not in college, you know, two months, one day, and three hours after they get their <laughs> high school diploma, <laughs> life is over. Right. You know, for a lot of people, knowing what you want to do uh, comes from knowing what you don't want to do. So the prep year, taking a year off, is often um, important. But I would just make one point. We are, we are focused completely on, you know, what I call academic maturity, right? But knowing, knowing why you want to go um, and what you want to study and what your career interests are, in my view, that's, a, that's as important a signal as to when to go. Um, almost 60% of arts and science majors, which I was, by the way, uh, are ending up, you know, in jobs uh, with, with degrees and uh, moving back home and underemployed. And so you really need to be focused today, I think. And when you're focused and you have the academic skills, I think that's when you should go. And for a lot of people, that's not right out of high school. That's a difficult question to answer. Uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, and Dad, I, I know you watch online sometimes. <laughs> I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And, and there are a lot of people who mm -hmm. face that. It, it used to be uh, Americans would get a job wherever and they would stay there for 500 years. Now they shift around and change uh, in places they employ. They move around the country all, all the time. It, it's just, it, it's very difficult to get your arms around a, a good education. Well, David, as far as moving around, I was visiting a software company in Philadelphia and their HR director said what they try to do with their employees is to give them a series of interesting gigs. 
So rather than, than the employees seeing a linear path of moving from supervisor to manager to vice president, is the employees want interesting projects. They want things that's going to build their skills, which then gives them more flexibility. And not only gives, keeps them interested at the time, but increases their employability. And that's what we're seeing more is how do you get people in the, the right situation for a time, which gives them the skill set to be employable for the next, next phase of their life. I think also just that there's some confusion between moving around in many jobs and having many careers. In my field, many careers, we call that a troubled work history. <laughs> the fact yeah. that people move a lot and have a lot of jobs um, is, does not diminish the importance mm -hmm. of trying to make career choices because most people who are successful have only one or two careers. Mm -hmm. They may take a lot of jobs. In fact, mm -hmm. the research shows that the more different jobs a young person has in the first 10 years of their career, the higher they will go in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Can I get you to interpret that a little bit? It well, in other words, when you think about it, someone who moves up fast in an organization or moves from organizations and every time they move, they get a better and better, better job. That's all these different jobs, right? And so the farther they go up the career ladder or, you know, the higher up you go in the, the office building, I guess, um, determines to a great extent whether you'll be the CEO or not. Right? So my point is that People shouldn't be focused on, you know, some people say, well, there's so many jobs, it doesn't make any sense to prepare for any one of them. But we're not in the business of preparing people for jobs. We're in the business of preparing people to make decisions about careers and pursuing that career. You talked about the, um, the kids, uh, being able to recognize a kid who probably shouldn't uh, go immediately into college or, or, or may, may never, uh, you know, attendance records at, at high school and things like that. There is a, a perception, a stigma almost, that the smart kids go to college and everybody else goes somewhere else or doesn't go to college. Meaning that those people who may not have gone to college right away aren't in the smart group. And that's, that's a dangerous stigma. How do you shake that and, and say, you know what, Votech, people who can do things with their hands, build, uh, manufacture, is just as important as the decision makers. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes I think that the uh, young <laughs> students that have the most courage are the ones that decide not to go. Right? And in fact, um, from what I read, some of the Ivy League colleges now actually encourage people to take a prep year. Um, but there's another thing that goes on, and that is that sometimes people get confused between college and status and college and careers, meaning what they're really perhaps interested in is just, is just getting a degree, um, and then they end up underemployed. You were talking at the, at the uh, offset here of, um, I mean, Penn State has the, the, I call it the Commonwealth Campus System. Am, am mm -hmm. I living in the past or is it still Commonwealth Campus? I always forget. It's Commonwealth Campus. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> trying to think. <laughs> yeah, the, things have Uncle changed, so you have to keep up. Right. Uh, and there are many, many campuses around, around mm -hmm. the state. Uh, and there's the four-year degrees, mm -hmm. you know, Penn State, uh, University mm -hmm. Park, and, and Altoona mm -hmm. have four-year degree programs. Mm -hmm. What are the other types of things? If somebody look at a Penn State campus, and I, I don't want to sound mm -hmm. like a commercial, but what type of things could somebody who's thinking, eh, I've been wanting to go back to school, would they run into? What do you mean by run into, uh, Look at the, uh, the, the courses that mm -hmm. are available to them. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing, David, is, is, is part of the conversation here is 30% um, of the students at the Commonwealth campuses are over, third, are over 24. So to hmm. your point, there's a lot of mm -hmm. people that have stopped out and have come back. And uh, just the other day, I was in Altoona and met with a number of adult students, and they are very serious students. I mean, they're paying out of their own pocket. Many of them, being a student, is their fifth or sixth um, identity. I mean, they're a parent, they're right. active in their church, they're active mm -hmm. in their, their, their uh, uh, community. Um, so there's, the, the campuses are very, very diverse. Uh, there's about 16,000 overall Penn State students are over, over um, 24. And across the country, about 38% of students are over 24. So there's a large cohort of students that are coming back, and then they, they come and they drop in and take some courses. They might get a certificate, move on to a degree or whatever. But the, the campuses, there's a full range of programs. Uh, many of them reflect um, 
uh, a legacy as far as their expertise or, or their areas of emphasis, but also made them align with the sectors that are around the campuses. For example, just one is, is Barron's up in the north. West has a real focus on the plastics industry, but they also have business and liberal arts and, and a full complement of programs. But they also align with some of the sectors that are nearby. And we're, we're down to just a little bit of uh, time left in the show, like 30 seconds or so. And if I could get you to uh, touch base one more time on, on the level of technical need, student need in, in Pennsylvania. Is it high compared to college graduates or equal, or do you think? Well, Pennsylvania literally does not have an organized system to pre prepare people to technician level, but it's pretty well recognized among economic development folks that the key, the labor force key to economic development is skill alignment of technicians. Firms bring their engineers with them. Right? They need people who can do things. All right, gentlemen. As I said at the offset, this, this could take weeks, months, years, or even a career, as it were. Uh, that is going to wrap things up for this edition of Pennsylvania Inside Out Issues. We always do invite your response to our programs, and uh, you can reach us via email to painsideout at psu.edu or via the U.S. Mail at 120 Outreach Building. University Park, Pennsylvania, 16802. Thanks very much to our guest tonight, uh, Kenneth Gray, the professor in charge of Penn State's Workforce Education and Development Program in the College of Education at Penn State. Wow, your business card must be uh. huge. <laughs> and Craig Weideman, Penn State's Vice President of Outreach, a uh, division that does include our continuing education, agricultural extension, and Penn State Public Broadcasting. For all of us here at WPSU, thank you very much for watching. Good night.